So this morning we heard from uh, Ms. Wassel and Mr. Frank from Northwest Haida and their study of marijuana legalization in the state of Washington. I want to welcome them back to present their methodology and their data. Uh, they have done a very thorough uh, analysis of the impact that legalization of marijuana has had on the state of Washington uh, over the last uh, two years. And they published the report as uh, indicated uh, this morning. So we're going to invite them back to do a more detailed analysis and presentation of the work that they do with Northwest Highway. I want to welcome them back. I just realized that I don't have the screenshot here, so I'll be looking at the same table more. Thank you again. Um, we have, as was mentioned, quite a bit more detail to talk about. Uh, I'll start with an unbelievably busy slide. Um, <laughs> we, as is the case in most of the, the three western states, are a net exporter of marijuana and have been for at least 15 years. Uh, we have been up to our hips in marijuana in Washington State uh, since BC Bud hit, made the headlines. Um, I began to believe that Washingtonians were jealous and a little bit annoyed at Canadians for provide, um, uh, producing better quality marijuana than we did, and so we went about the business of trying to grow the best weed on the planet. Um, I think we probably have gotten there, <clears throat> and this indicates in some small part what's going on. This is the eradication effort that's going on in Washington State as I speak. Uh, it's a joint effort between the Haida, uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Washington State Patrol, and representatives of the counties and cities that are impacted depending on where they are in, in the state. Um, if you don't know, Washington State is essentially two different states. The eastern side of the state, top topographically and climate-wise, is significantly different than the western side of the state. It is very produ uh, productive as far as agricultural activity goes, um, very high plateau areas, uh, mountainous uh, forests, um, and two very, very large Native American reservations. Uh, we have been seeing cartel growths go on, on particularly in, in public lands and Indian reservations now for I think about 15 years. Uh, this is a story of the uh, eradication success that we've had over the years. Uh, as you can see, in 2008 and 9, we were over 600,000 plants. Uh, that's about a billion dollars in marijuana. I don't know about you, but even if the state legalized, if I was involved in an industry that was making that much money, I would not tuck my tail between my legs and go back home. Uh, I'd come back every summer and continue to try to make that kind of money. So, um, over the years, we learned from our mistakes. We brought more resources into the, the picture. Uh, we were also um, the beneficiaries of two significantly funky summers in 2010 and 11. Uh, where we barely saw the sun, it was gray and wet all summer long, even in or Washington. And in addition to the activities and the strategies that were implied, or employed on the part of the eradication teams, we were also uh, the beneficiaries of really bad weather and bad growing uh, situations. So thus the decline that you begin to see in the right side of the graph. Uh, then we began to realize that we should go back to the same areas that we were in the previous year, that the cartels simply just don't pick up after they've invested in clear out another piece of land next June. Uh, chances are they'll come back to where they were before. Uh, unfortunately, it took us about seven years to figure that out, but we did. <clears throat> so now we're down to uh, about 40 to 50,000 plants a year. And of course, that's just what's been found. Uh, we understand that some of the cartels have returned to California. Uh, some have moved east into Idaho, uh, southeast into the mountain states. Um, but it's still a thriving, illicit um, activity. And that's another busy slide um, produced by my friends at the Washington State Patrol. You might not notice that the highways and freeways are the most prominent features in this map, uh, courtesy of the Washington State Patrol. Uh, those are the counties that uh, produced the most uh, plants last year. Uh, the northernmost county, the Red County, Okanagan County, is uh, complete, almost completely enveloped by the Colville Native Reservation. Uh, Yakima County, which is yellow, is almost completely enveloped by the Yakima Nation Reservation. Quite a number of, well, hundreds of square miles of those uh, reservations are completely undeveloped, even without roads. 
So most of the cartel roads are uh, reached by foot or by helicopter. Uh, we estimate that it takes some of the grow teams up to a week to find their locations and get set up um, before they can even start developing the, the cultivation process. Uh, so we're also looking at indoor growth, so proliferation of indoor growth on the western side of the state, particularly in King County and Pierce County. Uh, it's been uh, a movable feast, a difficult thing to get our arms around. Uh, the illicit um, market in Washington State really is still an unknown to us. Um, when we had a medical marijuana community in the state, it was completely unregulated. We had no idea how many uh, authorizations were out there. We were the only medical marijuana state in the country without a registry. We had no idea how many cards were out there, how many dispensaries were out there, what the size of the market was, um, how much it was worth. And so after July, this past July 1st, um, as the dispensaries were closed, and the medical marijuana product line was folded into the recreational stores. Uh, we're still now getting a feel, now that we can actually clearly identify the outlines of the black market, which we had never been able to do before, assuming that there was quite a bit of overlap between the medical marijuana community as a grain market and the black market, quite a bit of um, interactivity there. We're now getting a sense for how big the black market is and what we're actually competing against as far as price points, as far as availability, as far as the location of the retail stores and the recreational system. Um, still a learning curve for quite a number of us. Interestingly, this poll was taken last November. Um, among Washingtonians, if they were asked then, uh, compared to what they were asked in November of 2012, the ballot issue was um, in place. More people in Washington state are supportive of legal marijuana now than they were in 2012. So there's an upside as far as what's going on in our state. Uh, I can't really explain that other than there have been no huge mishaps, no significant catastrophes. Uh, we also went about the business of setting up the entire infrastructure without allowing the industry a seat at the table. That has not happened in Oregon. That has not happened in Colorado. It's not happening in Alaska. And I would caution you, if you have to cross that bridge in November, do whatever you can to keep the industry out of the discussion. Otherwise, it's going to be a self-serving, completely, um, I can't think of the right word, dysfunctional uh, process that lands on the side of the industry almost every time. Unlike Colorado, I've been taking a look at Colorado and Oregon in particular. Um, at least 50% of both those states have uh, moratoriums or bans in place. Uh, it's, it was surprising to me to see how little of Colorado in terms of territory, counties and cities, actually is allowing the commerce to, to occur. From the, looking at what I've seen, the majority of the state has restrictions on the availability of recreational marijuana, as is the case in Oregon. Uh, most all of Eastern Oregon have moratoriums and bans in place. It's only the Will Willamette Valley that really is the center of commercialization in Oregon State. Washington, on the other hand, has only 10% of our land mass with a moratorium or a ban. The red counties are the only places in the state where there are active, sweeping moratoriums or bans in place in regard to commercial activity. And in fact, Yakima County is only in the unincorporated parts of the county. Yet the city of Yakima and the other large towns in the county are allowing commercial activity. And Clark County, on the Oregon border, um, includes the city of Vancouver, which has free, open commercial activity going on as well. So only two out of 39 counties in Washington state have effective bans and moratoriums. Otherwise, it's wide open. Uh, the legaliz uh, legalization effect, um, how would it change your behavior? Um, most people said that it really won't change your behavior significantly whatsoever. And of course, this survey was taken with adults. Uh, youth were not included in that. Some say that their use will go up a little bit because of recreational availability, but by and large, um, we're not looking at a significant impact on adults in Washington State. We are in a state that has been up to our armpits in marijuana for the last two decades, and the addition of 500 recreational stores, essentially replacing 1,300 dispensaries, is not going, at least in my estimation, to have a significant impact on the availability and accessibility of marijuana for adults. The impact on Washington State has been on kids. 
kids now consider, ask an 18 year old, what's the likelihood of you getting busted for having a six pack of beer at a party? Close to zero. That's equated now with marijuana. They don't consider it to be any more of a risk than being in possession of, in possession of tobacco or being in possession of alcohol. Exactly the same. So you're seeing the perception of harm fall through the floor. You're seeing all the indicator data that is alarming, um, dealing almost exclusively with minors and youth. Adults really have not been impacted by this in Washington State. So, a little bit of an update. Uh, of the 281 cities and towns in Washington State, essentially most everybody is on board. Uh, and this is a moving target. Uh, city councils have had moratoriums, temporary moratoriums in place for a six month, a nine month, a 12 month period. They've revisited the um, issue down the road. I was just at a city council hearing in Yakima two months ago and they decided to do away with their moratorium. They could see dollar signs and so tax revenues coming down the road and it was time for Yakima to get into the marijuana business. Um, 39 counties, again, only four have prohibitions. Uh, four have actually taken no action whatsoever, which is very interesting to me. I don't know if they're stuck their head in their stand and they're thinking that it's all going to go away at some point, uh, or they're just keeping, uh, hoping for the best outcomes. The Liquor Cannabis Board has eliminated the cap on production um, coverage, the canopy. When Initiative 502 was originally passed, there was a very explicit limit on the production of marijuana in Washington State. Demand has so far exceeded um, supply so, uh, over these last two years that that cap has been removed. And we are now headed toward our 557 stores, I believe, um, and 412 with 351 that have medical endorsements, which was the fallback when the dispensaries closed. 502 stores could apply to the Liquor and Cannabis Board to become medically endorsed as well as recreational stores, and obviously the majority of those are doing so. Uh, we have nearly a thousand producers, nearly a thousand processors, some of which are both producers and processors. Uh, you cannot uh, double back on retail licenses, but you can if you're a producer and a processor, you can have more than one. And again, we're close to a billion dollars in retail sales, close to 200 million dollars in tax revenues. However, Initiative 502 had this elegant, very attractive, very detailed schedule of where the revenues were going to go once 502 passed. Um, quite a bit in regard to research, quite a bit in regard to prevention, uh, quite a bit in regard to infrastructure and, and increasing the capacity of the Liquor and Cannabis Board to be both an enforcement body and a regulatory body. Uh, unfortunately, in Washington State, when an initiative is passed, it's only sacrosanct, sacrosanct in the legislature for two years. After 24 months, the legislature can essentially do whatever they choose with that money, regardless of what the initiative originally said. And as you can assume, at the 25th month, it all basically went into the general fund. The marijuana fund, for all intents and purposes, has disappeared. And it's now just another revenue stream in the state of Washington with no exclusive expenditures associated with it and no new activities um, that will be supported on an ongoing basis. That's how sales looked after the first 15 months. Uh, it's no surprise that Central uh, Puget Sound um, dominates that because last time I uh, when Rand Corporation came in just before the election in 2012, they took a look at the state and, and realized that 50% of the marijuana consumption goes on in Snohomish King and Pierce Counties, which are those three counties on eastern Puget Sound. Um, no surprise either that the border, border counties were un unbelievably busy. Clark County on the border with Oregon, Spokane County on the border with Idaho, Walking County on the border with Canada. Although I have to really admire those who may be crossing the international border with Washington marijuana because it's quite an undertaking. Uh, what, let's see, um, oh, where do you get it? Um, and this has changed, obviously, because this was done in last uh, December when there were still dispensaries. But surprisingly, a, a large number of people were already going to the recreational stores. A significant number of consumers had decided that their old buddy, Mike, that they met in college, who's been dealing out of his basement for the last 40 years, uh, called him up on a Friday and said, Mike, uh, I'm pretty low, man. I need to replenish my stash. Mike says, well, I'm taking my family on vacation for two weeks. Uh, sorry, you're going to be dry, dude. You're, you're just, you're SOL. 
now it's like, oh, okay, I guess I'll just have to go to the nearest 502 store and take care of that. So it's um, a much different proposition now in regard to doing business in the black market as opposed to doing production in the black market. Uh, and the recreational stores have really begun to uh, assume a prominent place in the commerce. This is what happened when we closed the dispensaries on July 1st, just over a month ago. Uh, net sales in the 502 stores increased 30%. We went from $1.5 million in sales per day to over $2 million in sales per day. Uh, and that's again with only about 400 stores in place right now. And we're expecting that it'll probably go up again um, over subsequent months until it plateaus at some point mid-year next year, maybe. Because the market continues to mature, uh, folks continue to get more comfortable going to a marijuana store, which is still very weird for a lot of folks. And, and to top everything off, folks in Washington State feel quite strongly that the nation should uh, legalize marijuana. That we're um, doing quite well. Uh, that uh, things seem to be on an even keel, and it's about time that all 50 states legalize. So that's the view from Washington State, at least through these eyes. And now I'll turn it over to Allison, who will talk a little bit more about the report that we published last March that looks much more definitively at some of the data and some of the outcomes and the impacts that uh, legalization has had. Allison. slide from earlier. Um, I'm also sure that you remember that I talk really fast. Um, I get excited. So um, first and foremost, I want to let you guys know that these PowerPoints and presentations will be made available for you guys, so please don't feel the need to jot down everything. Or if I go fast with a slide, or I miss something, or I just go way too fast, you guys will have everything here. Um, but as Steve had mentioned, we're going to go over our report, which was released in March of this year, um, which is pretty exciting. A lot of uh, effort went into it. Um, but essentially, we were tasked with, hey, we have this whole legalization thing in our state. What does it mean? What does it look like? And what is our future going to be as the years come with this legalization in place? So we had four basic goals. First, we needed to create an impact report. What were these impacts from our medicinal side as well as our newly implemented recreational side? We needed to create a descriptive snapshot of our state so we could describe to anybody in public health, in law enforcement, in education, to parents, what was going on in our state and what it looked like. So that's where the regulatory overview came in. What were these confusing brand new laws that came in and shifted its whole head, you know, upside down? What were they? What do they look like? But where are the gray areas specifically? And finally, a literature review of the available data that was within our state. And I'm sure as many of your states, there isn't very much out there. So what was the good, reliable, valid data that I could grab to build that snapshot in our state? So we broke it down into 10 sections that you can see here, um, which we will go over here briefly. We've got a legal and a regulatory overview, youth and adult impacts. We've got impaired driving, diversion, THC extraction, which is your BHO labs, uh, marijuana-related crimes, the current markets, as well as the upcoming markets, which Steve and I keep alluding to, which rolled over in July of this year. So to start a legal overview. And this is kind of what I touched up with this morning, a little bit of the history within our state. So we had medical marijuana passed in 1998 through I-692, and our recreational marijuana in 2012 through I-502. We also go into the federal memos that kind of provided the federal overview guidance of these different of these new legalizations. So in 2009 with the Ogden memo, it was saying, hey, medical marijuana that is associated with these types of crime, you know, money laundering, drug cartels, we can't have that. That is a federal priority point that we need to protect. In 2013 with the Cole memo, it was all about preventing those activities from occurring within the recreational marijuana market. Again, with money laundering cartels, keeping drug driving down and not letting it get in the hands of children. And finally, we have the 2014 Monty Wilkinson Memo, which was providing guidance to those federally recognized tribes throughout the nation that, hey, if they want to become involved in the market, these are your priority points as to how you need to go about your business um, if you do want to go down that road. Section two is our regulatory overview. So this is our Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board, where um, they used to be the Liquor Control Board, but they changed that second seat of cannabis. Um, their regulatory authority over the recreational marijuana industry. And they're responsible for the licensing process, product rules, 
um, industry guidance, legal recommendations, and regulatory enforcement checks. Um, these are things that they are allowed to go and do, but maybe they don't do so much and so often. Um, Steve and I have had many discussions on the Liquor and Cannabis Board, and you know they are very primarily alcohol and tobacco, and marijuana got thrown into their lap. So they already are limited resources, limited uh, you know, unit enforcement personnel, and here you go, here's a brand new marijuana industry, go make it work. So, um, but they're given all of this to go do, and we're kind of steadily trying to figure out where their feet are, where the priorities are, and how we're going to move forward. <coughs> so our licensing landscape here, um, as I mentioned earlier this morning, we have three different types of licenses in our state. Your producer, who's your grower, your processor, who's your manufacturer, and your retailer, who's your storefront. Your producer's and processor, which Steve and I have mentioned, you can hold together. So we took their data and uh, broke it down to see how many are just a standalone producer, a standalone price processor, based on their tiers, the ones for a combination in those tiers, and the retailing amounts that we had. And as a note, our data is from July 2014 to July 2015. So this is just a one-year snapshot. Our state had approved over 1,100 licenses for the entire state, but because some of those are duly licensed, we have about 735 individual businesses across Washington state. Oh, and producer processors, um, those combination ones, were about 58% of our industry, so we were probably pretty heavy on the uh, producing and manufacturing side, which Steve mentioned we're up to our armpits, and now we're well above our head. Um, again, our Washington state is completely two different states bound into one. So our western side of the state is very uh, liberal, very open, um, whereas the east side of the state is very rural and very conservative. So when we talk about these licensed um, retailing locations in our state that were approved, it was based on that jurisdictional population um, skew that the Liquor and Cannabis Board imposed. But if you look at where the retailing stores are located, We've got 75% of them on our western side of the state where the majority of our population is and the majority of the users are, and only 25% for the rest of the half of the state. The state knows that they're going to generate the most of their revenue, and that's where they put their stores. In addition, our state also uh, passed these administrative codes for regulatory violations that we can impose on recreationally licensed business in our state under these four main categories. So you've got the violations against public safety, regulatory violations, licensing violations, and marijuana producer violations. And so we took all that data and broke it down to see which were the most um, common occurring violations per these categories. And you can see with number one, 90% of the group one violations against public safety involved minors. So this was anything from either a licensed store from a producer, processor, retailer, letting underage uh, youth frequent the premise, either just hanging out or actually being an employee of to the retailer or business themselves actually selling to a minor under that legal age of 21. Group two, and you can also see it uh, repeated in group four, were violations against the traceability system. And I really like to use quotations when I talk about the traceability system, because that is the whole seed to sale, you know, we're going to monitor everything, all this plant's going to be tracked, it's going to be wonderful, it's going to be great. But again, you put all the power in the industry to actually report their sales. So it's only as good as the information that goes in there. And you can see that we've got 30% of the group two and 46.5% of group four violations are issues surrounding that inventory system that's supposed to track everything. And we don't know what's happened because of it. We don't know how much has been leaked out, how much that wasn't inaccurate. And most of the time, they get to stop on the risk, hey, just don't do it again. And we don't know. And finally, Group 3, we had 76% of violations to get the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board Group Operating Plan. So this is them operating outside of what they were actually telling uh, LCB that they were supposed to be doing, which could be any number of things. They could be doing um, their waste destruction in a way that wasn't supposed to be appropriate, um, and hiring employees like they weren't supposed to. It could be any number of things. And production. So again, this is one year of our commercialized state how much we produce, and it was just shy of 60,000 pounds of marijuana. Well, if you break it down, though, to the ounces and to the grams, I could put one ounce of marijuana on every seat in CenturyLink Stadium, where our Seahawks play, 14 times of how much we produced in one year. And I don't know about you guys, but when I go to a football game, I normally buy like a hot dog. I don't want to buy pot when I leave. <laughs> 
infused products. So this is kind of my favorite part of the report. So our liquor and cannabis board, they have a four-person panel review board that actually will go through um, and approve these types of products before they hit the shelves. So if I'm a producer processor, hey, I want to make this cookie. They have to submit a whole plan to LCB saying this is how it's going to be packaged, this is how it's going to be labeled, I promise that the THC is going to be evenly distributed, so on and so forth. LCB gives a stamp of approval and then boom, it's out on the shelf. So we took that data and broke it down into these broad categories of baked goods, which are your cookies and your brownies. You have desserts, chocolate, caramels, and truffles. Candy, which are your pebbles and gems um, and nuggets. And then you have snacks, which are pita chips, trail mix, fruit snacks. Liquid forms such as drinks, honey sticks, or syrups are miscellaneous category, including your tinctures and your breath mints. And you can see that 68% of our industry is in that baked goods and desserts category. So when most of us think of these infused products hitting the shelves or they want to have marijuana infused products, this is generally what we think of, right? You've got your cookie, your brownie, your chocolate, and maybe a candy. It can't get any weirder than that, right? Yep, nope. So, um, here are a couple of examples, and these are real approved products in our state that our state board has approved for recreational sale. The first one is tomato basil infused soup. We have hot cocoa mocha mix, cannabis sugar packets, um, almonds infused with cannabis, we have soda, we have breath strips, we have honey sticks, and we have fruit snacks. Right? Oh, there's more. How about your, uh, it's called a hot chronic, and it is literally a little plastic spoon dipped in hot chocolate infused with THC, so in the holidays you stir it in warm milk and do your thing. Um, those are all the various tinctures and lotions to do whatever. Um, you have cinnamon and sugar pita chips. You have the catapult coffee pods, which do in fact fit in most curings. Um, you have transdermal patches, mints. Another personal favorite is the pumpkin spice latte flavored infused vaporizer. Um, and can kiss lip balm. All these products are states that, yep, that's good. Put on the shelf. That's what you get when you walk into our recreational stores. Kind of fun, right? Okay, youth impact. So we talked about the gummy bears and candy bears. This is, you know, the ultimate audience that we keep alluding to is to the children. Okay, well, what's going on with kids in our state? So I mentioned the survey earlier, the Healthy Youth Survey, and it's implemented every two years. So this is data from 14, and like I mentioned earlier, in 2016, right now they're collecting data, which will be released this spring. Um, we just pulled out a couple slides just to talk about some of the most notable issues. And first and foremost, the students who reported riding with a driver who had used marijuana was one in five tenth graders and one in fourth twelfth graders. And if you flip it to students who reported driving within three hours of using marijuana, was 9% of 10th graders and 17% of 12th grade seniors. Needless to say, these are questions that are going to be asked this year and we're going to continually prepare and build forward. But already in 2014, that was, this data was only collected six months into our commercialization. Now we're going to have almost two full years of data to look at and really see what the impact is with those students and that youth. Our Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, they produce a yearly behavior report. Oh, 10 minutes, we're going to go fast. Um, so they pulled out statewide student expulsion data for uh, substance abuse. So this is just looking at marijuana as compared to alcohol, illicit drugs, um, and tobacco. And we can see that 48% of statewide expulsions and 42% of statewide suspensions were related to marijuana in our state. And these are some of the confiscated items from students. You got two different types of vaporizers, you got two different types of candy bars. Our Seattle Public Schools actually made an uh, article to Como News, one of our major news stations in the city, and said they actually had to increase their confiscation box space because they're getting so much from students that they're running out of room. Um, Seattle Public Schools again gave a survey to their high school students in the year 2013-2014, and 23% of high school students consumed in the last month, 39% reported that that marijuana actually came from a dispensary. Uh, they had 758 drug and alcohol violations, and 98% of the 651 drug offenses were for marijuana alone. And if you fast forward to the 2014 2015 school year, September through January, 77% of those drug and alcohol violations were for marijuana alone. Our Washington Poison Center, we, they have been an absolute wonderful resource, so I highly encourage you guys to reach out to your Poison Center. Um, they gave us all this data broken down by age, by location, by anything you can imagine. They were very awesome giving us information. So in blue, you have the statewide total 
You have the red for those under the age of 20, and green 20 and above, and uh, the last category is an unknown age because callers aren't required to report their age. But you can see from 2012 to 2014, callers under the age of 20 increased 80%, and youth represented 45% of those calls in 2014. <coughs> Treatment admissions is housed in a, a database called SCOPE in our state, and you can see that marijuana for a very, very, very long time has outweighed alcohol and all other substances for why youth are entering into treatment. And if you compare 2013, 66% of total admissions were for marijuana, increased to 70% in 2014, and remained steady through 2015 at that 70% rate. Section 4, adult impacts. Um, the Young Adult Healthy Survey was implemented. It was an online survey through the University of Washington, and this surveyed students that were between the ages of 18 and 25 um, during that time of May 14 to July 2015. 43% had admitted using within the last year, 24% at least once a month, 17% used at least once a week, and 6% of those used daily. 15% of those respondents actually also admitted that they used for medicinal purposes, 11% of those used it for once a month, we had 9% used at least once a week, and 5% were daily consumers of medicinal marijuana. The National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is something that has been a reoccurring theme throughout the day, uh, we compared ourselves as well to the nation. Um, for past year and past month marijuana use for young adults and adults. Young adults were 6% higher than the nation for past year marijuana use at a rate of 38%, and Washington adults were 5% higher than the nation at 14%. And for past month marijuana use, our Washington young adults and adults were 5% higher than the nation during that time. Impaired driving. Um, this was mentioned earlier from Dr. Fiona Cooper from our Washington State Patrol uh, Crime Lab, I'm uh, sorry, Toxicology Lab, and she produces reports quarterly and yearly on our DUI information. So we provided this slide for you today. We've broken it down from 2011 through partway through 2015, the number of uh, impaired cases that tested positive for that active THC, not the metabolite, of drivers, and the number of percentage of those cases that were at or above that 5 nanogram per milliliter of blood level, which would be the you know, 0.08 version of your marijuana. Uh, we can see 2012, we had 62% of those cases were at or above the 5 nanogram limit, and in 2015, so far, was 44%. We've had a bunch of shift in our policy from law enforcement, um, one of the reasons being that, you know, in our state, it can take up to four hours to do a DUI now in our state, um, through a telephonic warrant, through different blood checks, all the different types of things. Um, so again, this is something that we're monitoring more um, into the future, but that's kind of where we're at right now. I didn't do it. Uh, Spokane Valley Police Department, this was based on the due diligence of the police chief in this uh, community. And Spokane is right next to Idaho. And so he collected information on a giant spreadsheet, gave it to me and said, here's all the marijuana stuff from 2012 to 2015. It has good stuff in it. Look at it. So I did. So in 2013, 14, and 15, I broke out youth marijuana DUIs um, to compare and see what these incidences were actually looking like. So these are marijuana only. This is no poly drug. This is no marijuana and alcohol. This is marijuana only for these drivers. In 2013, youth DUIs were 50% of the total cases, 64% of total cases in 2014, and 65% of the total DUI cases in 2015 so far. But what's most notably scary for me on this slide is if you look at the average active THC for those 18 and 19 year old drivers, well above that five nanogram limit. And if it takes a four hour time to do a DUI, what were they actually at their time of um, being pulled over? Okay, I'm gonna have to go really quick. Um, what's a good one? Okay, so we look at numbers of DUI and you're like, you know, people like to debate DUIs all the time. Well, isn't one just enough? This was an incident where a 19-year-old girl actually blew through a stop sign, no skid marks before the incident, hit a pastor who was riding on his bicycle to his church. <coughs> Needless to say, he died um, on scene. You can see his bicycle actually sitting on the hood of the car. They actually just um, put up this uh, memorial sign for him in the city of Puyallup. And I just wanted to include this, that one is more than enough. We don't, marijuana, DUI, driving, bad news. Like, one is too much. Uh, diversion, um, I'm going to skip to this slide. So from 2012 to 2015, Washington State origin marijuana was destined for 43 individual states in the nation. So not saying it only went 43 times to other states. No, that's 43 individual states. So they were going to Texas multiple times, Florida multiple times, New York multiple times, over and over and over again. Our domestic highway enforcement, so our Washington State Patrol is the primary house of this database. 
And in 2015, only nine months, they had seized over 71 pounds off of the highway. Seattle King County had a seizure alone of 19, and Bellingham had a seizure of 21 pounds. And I like to point this out because this isn't somebody who's a little bit over possession or a little bit over what they should have. No, these are people with intent. And these drivers are actually on their way to Canada. Our Washington State marijuana is going out. And we're going to skip because I know I'm on a timeline. Um, THC extractions or BHO labs, big booms, not good. Um, 2014, we actually had 17 THC reported labs within our state, 10 of which were located on our western side and 7 were located on the east. One of our most notable um, cases was actually called Operation Shadow. It's a federally, federally uh, taken case where charges were included in endangering human life or manufacturing controlled substances, uh, maintaining a drug involved premise, and manufacturing hash oil and marijuana. Um, this is actually an explosion aftermath photo from the Bellingham, um, sorry, Bellevue explosion, where uh, the former mayor actually uh, broke her hip as she was trying to escape the flames and actually died from her injuries. Like, when we're talking about THC extraction, we're talking about marijuana being a victimless crime. No, like, not good stuff. Uh, Section 8, marijuana related crime. I talked about Spokane Valley Police Member earlier. Same thing, due diligence on this police chief trying to keep track of all these records. So he gave me all this data, we broke it down to assault, theft, harassment, possession, vehicular related, explosion, and additional, vehicle, uh, additional crimes. Um, we can see possession, theft, and harassment crimes related to marijuana have been on the increase since 2013. This is ongoing data in which we are collecting from this uh, police chief and hoping to further it into the future. Our State Patrol Crime Lab, just real quick. Um, this data only goes back to 2013 because before, uh, before they used to have to do qualitation cases. So uh, qualitation testing. So pretty much it was green, leafy, stinky substance, marijuana, yes or no. Now with the legalization, they have to do quantitation cases. How much THC is actually in this marijuana? Because it's either usable, it's either a concentrate, it's either an extract, extract whatever may have you. So 80% of those quantitation cases for 2015 involved minors. Those under the legal age of 21. The current markets, we'll just go into some sales real quick for the first year commercialization. Our total sales were over $307 million, and retailers in July 2015 were averaging over $1.9 million a day in sales, and total excise generated was over $76 million. Our medical reported taxable sales, because our medical market being so unregulated for so long, never had to full, never had a full requirement to actually post their real taxes. They didn't have a traceability system, they didn't have an inventory system, they didn't have anything. So this is based upon what they said, based on them. So their total uh, reported taxable retail sales during that same one year timeline was almost $110 million, and their highest month was December with over $12.4 million accounted for that month alone. Our upcoming market, this was something I touched on earlier, we are now medical, medical and recreational integrated market now. We have a new taxing rate, new taxing structure, and new disbursements, as well as a wide open door for tribes to enter into our market. In conclusion, we tie back to the coal memo. So our coal memo priorities are being impacted. Diversion is ongoing. That hasn't stopped. Our treatment emissions are consistent between uh, youth and with adults. DUI and traffic fatalities have increased. Youth sources have remained unchanged legalization because we're still having seizures of them getting their hands on it. And the relationship between marijuana and crime is continuing. None of that has stopped. And in the famous last words of the report of this man right here, uh, most notably, markets survive if demand remains strong. As addiction is one of the possible consequences of consuming this substance, the state is assured a stable market. <laughs> Thank you. last two speakers of the day and try to end on time today. And we have two more phenomenal spe speakers for you. 